uh, how do you study this uh, interpreting trans linguistic world? Can you give me a little bit of your background? Yes, well, it was um, kind of a coincidence and it was a different or a multiple step process, if you will. But early on as a child, I, I always felt a love for uh, for languages. And I remember asking my parents to send me to learn English when we were on vacation from school. And of course, I was taking also English in school, but mostly because I wanted to know what my favorite songs were saying, and they were all in English. So that was kind of um, how I got started. But then when I finished high school in Ecuador, I convinced my parents to send me abroad to study. And I got into a program for international students, which uh, was in, in the Pompano Beach, Florida area in, in Florida. So I, I took that, that program for six months, which was intensive um, English only for international students. And uh, when I was, I was done with that, I, I went back home and decided to study marketing and international business. And more, mostly I picked that career because I thought, well, I could use my language skills in that profession, not really because I was that much into marketing or business, but I thought this would be perfect because I could use my language skills. And then I studied a little bit. I moved to Georgia and I, I went to school here and I was going to business school, but uh, I had to drop out of college because of um, a family emergency in, uh, in Ecuador. And as I was not able to go back to college for a little bit, I decided that I, I was just gonna work full time until I could figure out what to do. And I started working at a restaurant and a coworker of mine one day came up to me and said, hey, uh, my boyfriend, she said, who was an LEP, he had to go to court. And uh, so he apparently had been accused of something, had, had to go to court a few times. And she said he, he's always had an interpreter and in this particular court, she said they had a, a team of interpreters uh, for him. And she said, I think you'll be really good at it. You should go and find out what you need. So I went to the courthouse and talked to the court administrator. And she was very nice, gave me all the information. She was actually involved somehow with the court certification program at the time with the Georgia Commission on Interpreters. And she gave me all the information and I, um, I called, I applied, and I got, I got started in the, uh, in the program with the uh, Supreme Court. And that I obtained my license at some point, you know, um, at, at the time, you got a registration that which would allow you to work in court, but you had to still be certified to do trials or to do felony court. Uh, but I, I got my registration. I figure I'm going to start getting jobs with agencies until I can gain some experience and I can study and prepare for the oral certification exam, which that actually took me about three years. But I actually got started because I started sending out my resumes and nobody would call me as I was, I was only 23. I didn't have, I didn't have any work experience other than a few months in a restaurant. Uh, and, and then I was a college dropout at that point, but I, I, I kept calling back and one day I called an agency and it just so happened that they had just got off the phone with a client who needed an interpreter right, right away. And then I called, so they sent me to this assignment and once I was done, I really knew in my heart that this is something that I wanted to do as a professional and not just as a gig or as a side job. Uh, and then after that, I went back to the interview with the owner of this company and she actually offered me a job as a manager nice. for, for that agency on, on my very first <laughs> interview for a job. And so then I got started. And I actually, my background was, was 
basically only in core interpreting, but a good friend of mine, who I think you also interview, uh, Xiomara, she's the vice chair of, of CMI. She and I met back in 2004 in, in a, uh, one of the many trainings I went to. And she had gotten a job full time at a children's hospital. So she called me one day and said, hey, they're, they're looking for full time interpreters here. And I said to her, no, I'm not interested because I really want to work as a core interpreter and I need to study and, and get prepared for the uh, for oral exam. Plus, I was also working as a manager in this company, and I said no. But they eventually opened up some positions at the hospital uh, as BRN, uh, per diem. And I thought, well, if I can go and work some weekends and nights doing medical interpreting, that would be fine. And that's how I got started also doing medical interpreting, which I am so glad I did because both... Uh, fields of interpreting they're absolutely fantastic and I'm, I'm actually very passionate about both of them and even though I still do mostly core interpretation um, I, I work once a week at the hospital and now I'm, I'm the president of, of the medical interpreter so that's kind of kind of an irony in a way <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited about that by the way and, and before we jump in into the whole presidency and your goals, um, I do have a question for you, kind of put you in the spot. Um, is there a specific moment during your interpreting life that, uh, that you were like, oh, wow, that, that this is why we have interpreters and this is why um, we need more interpreters and, and I'm so glad I was there, whether it was a challenge that, that you had or something that, that you know that you made a difference? Uh, yeah, there have there have been several. I mean, I've been working as an interpreter as um, for now fifteen years, but um, I remember specifically a moment that actually made me realize how important our career is, or or my career as an interpreter is, and it has actually nothing to do with an interpretation, but with a situation that I had in college. Uh, because a few years after I dropped out of college, I went back to school, but this time I decided to start to study languages. So, because I had already decided I'm not gonna do business and marketing, I wanna do languages and I wanna become a, a linguist and, and a language expert, so I went to school for that. And I was taking Spanish, which is also my native language, but one, um, two of my professors actually, um, they didn't know that I was an interpreter, and they were talking about how my, my university used to have a partnership with the Georgia Commission on Interpreters, where they, they would come to this university and teach the 16-hour class, hoping that some of the students of Spanish would get inspired or motivated to become uh, core certified interpreters. And what had happened was they decided to uh, cancel that program because two of my professors had taken the program as well and they had taken the, the oral certification exam and they had not been able to pass. And so they thought, well, if we can't pass this, obviously our students are not gonna be able to pass. So they were talking about that and I, I didn't say anything, but at the time I was already a certified interpreter. I had already passed the oral exam. And at some point, one of them asked me, what do you do? And I, you know, I, I told her and she was, she called me after class and said, you know what, you don't have to come to, to this class anymore. I'll just give you an A. But it was so important for me to know that even they have their PhDs and they went through the process and they couldn't pass the certification, which just shows just how it's, it's not as easy as people think that only because you're bilingual, because you have a PhD in Spanish or in languages, you're going to be able to pass. And then at that point, I developed an even greater appreci appreci appreciation for, for this profession because a lot of people just take it slightly and think, oh, you know, I can do that because I speak both languages. And in reality, if you want to go like all the way to the top in this profession, you really have to prepare yourself and 
and become a certified interpreter and go even further, if you will. Are there any resources that you recommend for those that are, are starting or want to be, uh, become professional interpreters? Well, first of all, I would say find out what, what specialty you would like to follow, whether it's, it's medical or legal or, or conference interpreting or uh, education inter interpreting, which is getting um, a lot of requests right now. It's getting big. I'm actually getting involved with some agencies to do, doing education to see if we can do some projects of mutual cooperation. But the most important thing I, I, I like to say people is that don't do it because you think you're gonna make easy money. Because there are plenty, plenty of people like that, that they go into this business thinking I'm gonna make easy money and then they get sort of frustrated uh, and they don't bring the passion that is needed. Especially, for example, if you're doing medical interpretation, you have to have compassion. If you don't have compassion, you're not gonna be successful in this field because part of what we do is, is compassion, convey a lot of the, the feelings of uh, providers and also of, of our patients. And it, it can be a difficult job at times because of all the information that we have to share and everything that we have to witness. And People need to know that, but if you don't have compassion, if you're only there for the money, most likely you're going to get burned out. So that's that's the one thing. If you're doing core interpreting, it's 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 very similar. I was I was telling someone that the reason why I like to do both is because when you're in the course setting, especially I used to do a lot of felonies, and when you do a lot of felonies, uh, and I actually read a. a, a an article about this, which I included as, as part of my research when I did my, that, the documentary. But there, there was an article that said that the, the, the um, perception of, of an interpreter tends to change because of the things that we see and do. And, and what they meant by, by that, and I give you an example. When I started doing, doing felonies in courts, I immediately became very distrustful because you're dealing with criminals, you're dealing with people saying, no, I didn't, I didn't kill this person, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. And, and you do it all, over and over and over with different people, it's, uh, every person every day, and it's, it's the same thing. So at some point in my case, I started noticing that, that I, don't, I don't trust anyone anymore. Every time someone says something to me, I always question if he or she telling me the truth. And, but it, I also became a cynic like thinking the world is is bad is this is a bad world and people are bad there's a lot of a lot of bad things happening out there uh, because that's basically if you go to felony court that's kind of the main theme but things that had happened now they're getting corrected through punishment but uh, that made me sort of harsh and uh, I felt a, a lot of times I felt cold I felt that I had sort of bottled up my feelings and I was becoming very hard and harsh. And then I started doing uh, medical interpreting and that reversed that mentality because I always tell people, if you really want to see goodness in the world, go to a hospital. You'll see like real angels, uh, doctors, nurses, social workers, uh, child life specialists. I, I used to work for a children's hospital. So, as, as a life experience has been you know, amazing to be able to do both. Most people, they do either one or the other. Um, and that's, that's okay, that, that's a preference. But I also would like, as part of my role as a president of the medical interpreters, to try to bring both fields closer together and to try to close that gap that it exists right now nice so as president of ming which is the medical interpreters network of georgia uh what can we expect uh, for those that are living in georgia and for those of like us that are could be visiting atlanta and kind of, uh, get in touch and see what's going on 
Well, before I decided to run, David, um, I, I consult with some people and ask for their advice because I, I'm, I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but I have never actually been a member of Mink up until a few years ago because my employer bought my membership and, and I went to a few events. But I know a lot of people due to my job in the medical field. Um, and, and I decided to ask for a, advice because as a core interpreter, and as a medical interpreter, as I said earlier, I want for, you know, both fields to work closer together. And for some people, sometimes that seems to be a little controversial. I noticed there's a lot of division, there's a lot of misconception. As I said, I feel that it's time to learn from one another and, 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 and close that gap because I can tell you from my point of view, I have learned so much from both fields, but right now we're not communicating, we're not communicating very well. In, you know, in my opinion. So the one of the first things I did, uh, even before I became president, was to get in touch with other organizations and see if they were interested in working with the Medical Interpreters Network of, of, of Georgia. And there, there was a lot of interest. And so I immediately decided to create a committee, which is called the Strategic Development Committee, and actually, I past main president, Dr. Orlin Marcus, is the chairman of that committee. And what they're going to do is they're going to work in projects of education. They're going to do outreach. They are going to be in charge of creating the uh, different conferences, uh, trying to get speakers, trying to get... The, the sponsors so that the board of directors would take sort of a break from that and we can just um, sort of manage and supervise because there's a lot of things that um, we need we need to be doing but but what, one of the main reasons is that that what, one of the main things that I want to do is provide our, our members a lot of possibilities or more possibilities for for education and especially with continuing education um, I we are, we're very interested in doubling our reserve by December of 2020 and we want to do um, to raise money to all uh, we want to do several activities because right now our situation and as far as our money reserve is okay, but it's not, in my, opi in my opinion, good enough to be able to do all the things that we had planned. Uh, so we're going to need that. I'm planning to increase the number of members by 125% by December of 2020. Also, because we uh, want to get more people involved in um, in this community. Also, this year we're celebrating our 20th anniversary of, of Mink, which I actually just learned a few weeks ago. And we are planning uh, some activities uh, for th this anniversary. One of the things that I have been able to do has, well, I got in touch with all the past presidents of me. Some of them live, well, one of them actually lives in California. So we're bringing her from California to celebrate the 20th anniversary. We wanna get, get all the past presidents together um, and also so, some of the founders. And I'm, I'm very interested in learning more about their original vision, what, were their original plans, and if there were any projects that they were planning on doing 20 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago that did not get realized or, or developed. I, and I would like to take over and see what we can do and also get their wisdom and help and their connections because they are, they are the mentors and they are the the elders and, and, 
and the wise men and, and wise women of this organization, and I definitely can use their their, their support. But our our main our main purpose is definitely education, and also create a presence. Right now, we don't have a political presence, for example, and I'm not aware of any any bills or any legislation right now that could affect us but that could happen that could change tomorrow and we need to to be prepared so part of the things that i have been doing i've been talking to other organizations to try to team up and i talked to the directors of the national association of judicial interpreters and translators naget they're based in atlanta now at the headquarters but the the board members are in, in california and so they are very interested in sort of um, guide us to what we need to do in case something were to happen in Georgia and how to take political action. So there's actually a lot to do, but I'm very happy and very excited because I've gotten a lot of support from past presidents and past board members and, and the current board that we have right now is absolutely fantastic. So I know that we're all gonna be doing a great job and I, I'm, I'm an outsider to this organization. I think that's a good thing because I'm coming with fresh eyes and, and ideas and let's see how that works. But I'm, I'm very hopeful. Very nice. So, now, what do you think of um, so, uh, some of the things to? You cannot cover a lot <laughs> in this in this last uh, few minutes. But one of the things that uh, I was going to ask you is uh, what would be a call to action for those that, are, that will listen to this interview. Well, um, I would say join join an organization, a local organization, being a part of. of of an organization will allow you to have the tools and, and resources that will be essential to your, to your career development. Um, volunteer opportunities, donations, I mean, however you can, you can get involved. Um, and specifically for our organization, we're definitely asking people to join us um, because we need a lot of support, we need, we need donation, we need we, we need volunteers. Um, and right now we're sort of in a process of restructuring our organization, but anywhere you are, whatever you are, if you're interested in developing uh, your career, advancing your career, um, continuing education is key, but also being part of an, of an organization because we can do greater things with if we're united, if you're by yourself, you have more limitations that if you are supported by an organization of a group of people that are following the same interests that, that you are. Are you on social media or do you have a website that you can share with us? We have, yes, we are in social media. We are on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, and LinkedIn, and our Website right now it's it's undergoing some maintenance. It's it's working, but it's mingweb.org. So that's m i n g w e w i b web dot org. So if you wanna check us out and if you want to uh, follow us on social media, I I can send you the link for our social media. So, uh, if you want, because I don't remember. Oh, no worries. We'll, we'll have it available on the links. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, but yeah, that, that would be fantastic if you, if you guys can follow us because we will be posting updates, we'll be posting uh, news and information. We are thinking or we're planning to have in 2021, one of our goals is to have the largest conference for interpreters in the Southeast. And so we're planning on begin to work on that in January of 2020. And that's gonna take about a year and a half to do the planning. But as I said, we have a great committee and a great team of people. And I know that we're gonna be able to complete that successfully. Well, thank you so much, Marcelo, for your insights and those wonderful tips. 
And uh, yeah, please uh, follow Ming at mingweb.org and we'll yes. have the links available. Thank you. All right, thank you. And I will send them to you. And I appreciate for this time and opportunity.